Chinese Medicine Society's third event. Um, we're here to welcome Daniel, uh, Dr. Daniel Kiran. <laughs> He's the author of Spark in the Machine and his newly written book, The Uncharted Body, which is here in the boxes here. Um, he is an MCEM, MB, CHB, LIC. He's <laughs> <laughs> a big mess of letters. That basically means that he's a member of the College of um, Emergency Medicine. He is a doctor and he's a licensed acupuncturist, actually a graduate from this very school. From this very college, um, class of 5.2? 5.2. Yeah, 5.2, yeah. He's a bit of a troublemaker as well. <laughs> <laughs> so um, today, uh, Dan will be sharing with us his uh, knowledge and information about the liver and the liver channel, and also liver three, and why it's so famously effective. So if everybody can give Daniel a warm welcome and... Oh yeah, please turn off your phones as well. Because yeah. we are, we're recording. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction, and I'm glad you got the letters right anyway. I'll look at why we there first. Double check it. So, um, yeah, I was here 13 years ago, and I remember writing about this point a lot, liver three, over and over again, and also this idea, liver cheese stagnation. And one of the things that occurred to me is a useful way to start to understand things is sometimes to go backwards. So in other words, to imagine that you're actually using this point and thinking, well, what's it actually doing when you use liver three? Why does it have such a broad range of effects? Um, so to answer that very simple looking question, really, why does liver three help liver cheese stagnation? We need to, firstly, we need to answer what is qi? Yeah? Because in order to ask, answer uh, why does liver 3 affect liver qi stagnation, we need to know what qi is first. So that's the first question we need to answer. The second question is what is qi stagnation? And then we can start wondering what normal liver physiology is. So actually, the word normal here is irrelevant because uh, physiology is the normal functioning of an organism. So I don't know how much uh, uh, nowadays is taught in terms of physiology and pathology, but for me, we can really look at the Chinese view of the body and we can look at the Western view of the body and we can understand Chinese physiology in terms of Western function, Western physiology, Western anatomy. So I find this word very useful to talk about physiology, and I mean it in the same sense as the Western medicine talks about physiology. After we've done that, we can ask, what is liver chi stagnation? So stagnation is pathology, and in order to understand pathology, we have to know what the normal function is. So once we know what's normal and how the chi is flowing through the liver, then we can start to understand what happens when it stagnates. So stagnation just means lack of movement. As we know, all health depends upon movement. As soon as you get a lack of movement, you get disease. So we're still not there yet. We've got six questions to get to before we can actually answer that one question. So then we need to know how does liver three connect to the liver? So I'm sure you're all aware liver three is on the foot. Yeah. So why does a point on the foot connect to the liver? Yeah, it seems like a fairly basic question to be able to answer. Doesn't it? Because if we can't answer that, then we can't really explain why liver three will affect the liver. And then finally, we can say the more nitty gritty, why in particular does liver three help clear liver cheese stagnation? Why is it such a useful point? Um, so only when we've answered these first five things can we actually start to discuss this? Why, does, why is liver three, why not liver four, liver five, liver eight? Why, why in fact anything on the liver channel itself? There might be other points and other channels at work. So for instance, pericardium points are also quite good at clearing liver cheese stagnation as well. And the reason for that is because the pericardium and the liver are linked. And uh, we might have time to go into that today, we might not. But let's 
go on. So the first, the most important question before we can understand anything within acupuncture theory is what is chi? So chi is, I would define chi, and I think if you can't define something, then you don't understand what it is. I would define it as the organizational energy of the body best seen in the embryo. Now, any of you who have read my first book, The Sparking Machine, know that I go on and on about embryology and about how the embryo grows and about how you need this energy in order for the embryo to grow and about how that, that I postulate that it's in fact electricity that's making this grow. Now, since I wrote that book, I stumbled across this video of a frog's face growing. I don't know how many of you have seen this before. <laughs> Everyone's seen this. Wow. Okay. This has been around for at least seven years. Um, actually, it's a kind of interesting story how I bumped into it because I don't know how exact what exactly happened, but I know exactly where I was because um, I was in a hospital room um, and my wife was giving birth to my daughter, and uh, and I don't know how I stumbled across this video. I must have just been. Uh, on my phone, and uh, maybe I was, I was trying to find out what was going on, and lo and behold, this video came up, and it was of a frog growing. Now, you can see the tadpole's eyes there, and you can see its mouth there, and this here is actually the neural tube here growing, yeah? So the light you can see is, is there because the electrical currents in these areas are so strong that they're actually generating light in the same way that our lights do. Yeah, the, 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 the electricity is flowing everywhere in this, the chi. So electricity is basically, chi is basically organized electricity in the same way that in your computer, the electricity is organized and that enables your computer to function and the same kind of process is occurring in your body. And so the electricity is organising here, the neural tube, the eyes, the mouth, the nose. And this is obviously on the loop. And the same on this one as well. So the scientists who took this uh, video, and it's a time lapse overnight, uh, the video supposedly was accidental. They'd left a time lapse on overnight, and it just caught this amazing video footage. Um, but they're very, very clear about what's going on. And they say that this is uh, the electrical... In fact, the, new, the paper that was actually uh, attached to this video, so the, you can find this online, um, says electrical currents govern frog face development. Or frog, frog development. <laughs> so it's very, very clear that they're saying the electricity <coughs> is guiding how the embryo develops. And, and this is exactly what chi is. Um, to me, this is so obvious that this is chi. So the most important thing in all of our health is how we develop. Because unless we develop correctly in the embryo, then we won't have health. We won't even be born. You'll get abnormalities. And if those abnormalities are severe enough, then you'll be aborted in utero. And so, and even after you're born, like that development is so critical. So for instance, there's abnormalities of the heart called wolf parkinson white where you get these tiny little defects and then the electrical current in the working heart is able to escape and creates these rhythms. Now, that tiny defect was there because the embryo didn't develop properly. So this is critical. Embryology, the, our health is so tied into embryology. It's the precursor of health. And so if we want to understand health, we have to understand embryology because those two things are linked and if we want to understand embryology we have to understand the simple most critical question which is how does the embryo self-organize yeah i hope um it, it, this is this is something that is barely discussed in western medicine yeah if you talk to any doctors about embryology just watch their eyes glaze over in fact, you can very radically kind of um, educate doctors about embryology because they know almost nothing about embryology. So if, if you want to kind of scare doctors as well and, they, and you, you want to get them on the back foot when they're talking about uh, how does acupuncture work and they say, say it's about embryology. <laughs> Watch their reaction. They'll, they'll run a mile. So the, the chi, chi is this 
force, this electrical, for want of a better word, this electrical force that's governing the development of the embryo. And this is actually Yuan Chi. So this is the character Yuan is drawn as a spring coming out of a mountainside or a source. So it's been translated as source, and it's not a bad translation. I would actually say it's more accurately kind of embryological chi. So you are chi, embryological chi that, that creates our, our bodies from scratch, from a single cell into the hundred trillion cell creatures that we are. But the chi that then functions within our bodies is uh, a different chi, isn't it? Because you all know there's, I forget all the different subcategorizations of chi. You were in, all in college, so you probably remember them. But, um, but you certainly have liver chi, heart chi, lung chi, yeah? And they move in different directions and they do different things. And in fact, if you, um, certainly if you read Wang Zhu Yi's book, uh, he says how the, I think it's in the Su Wen, they talk about how the triple burner is the origin of the source chi and then disseminates the organ chi. So in other words, there's this, so the idea that the triple burner is able to create, the, it, it creates the organs or is able to create the organs through the Yuan Chi. But then once the organs are established, the triple burner is also disseminating the, the Chi from the organs. So there's a, a difference between creating the body and the body functioning. Yeah, this is, this is, um, this is important in a bit when we start to talk about the liver. So that's the first question. It's a very quick answer to that question, obviously, because we've got six questions to get through. So, um, and it gets more and more complex. But the most important question of all, what is chi? So uh, the organizational energy of the body best seen in the embryo. Yeah. So the next question is, so what is chi stagnation? So even though I've just described chi as the organizational energy, I would actually say it's, it's a form of electricity flowing through our bodies. So you can see this in the heart. If you do an ECG, that's basically a, a flow of electricity through the heart. And it has this rhythm to it. And that rhythm is organization. And that organization allows the heart to beat in a coordinated manner and then send blood through the body. So one of the maxims of Chinese medicine is that the uh, qi is the, no, that's right. So blood is the mother of qi, and qi uh, controls qi, uh, what's the word? Governs. Qi governs, but it kind of moves blood, doesn't it? Qi moves blood, and, and blood mothers uh, qi. So there you see it in the heart. It's a really good example of this relationship between blood and qi. If you want to understand that relationship really clearly, you can see it in the heart. So the heart, the electricity in the heart, yeah, it can it moves in a certain way, a coordinated way, and it causes the heart then to contract. And when it contracts, it pushes blood. Yeah, and then the blood comes back to the heart through the arteries and it nourishes the heart, and it enables the heart to generate electricity. Yeah, which you can see on the ECG, which then pushes the blood. So you've got that cycle going. Now what happens if you get uh, some kind of blockage in the arteries? Then you, can no, you no longer get blood going into the heart. As a result of that, the heart muscles, the heart fibers, aren't able to generate the electricity, the chi, the coordinated electrical movement of the heart goes and the heart is no longer able to pump. So because you haven't got any chi, you are no longer able to govern blood, to move blood. So these two, these two things are very closely related, chi and blood. But we're talking here about chi stagnation. So chi stagnation, so in a heart attack, what I just described there was a heart attack. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Coronary artery thrombosis. And and importantly, in a heart attack, it's a lack of blood, but what will kill you is the lack of electricity, yeah? So, so if you have a heart attack, the lack of blood can cause a focal area within the heart where you get abnormal 
electrical generation, yeah, wind, that's wind, and that wind can then spread through the rest of the heart and give you a heart attack or a ventricular fibrillation or something like that. So chi stagnation is a little bit different to that because that's kind of like a lack of chi. Chi stagnation is where the chi is there but not moving. And, and what I meant to bring today actually was some balloons because balloons are a great example of stagnant electricity. And everyone's done it at a party, yeah? <laughs> Rub it against, and your hair sticks to the um, the balloon, yeah. And that that is kind of one of the defining qualities, I think, of stagnant electricity. Is it sticks things together. Um, so, and this becomes very important when we start to ask what is happening within liver chi stagnation and, and what when cheese moving uh, cleanly through the liver, then the liver functions very smoothly. I actually see the electricity running through all of the organs, but especially the livers, as some almost like grease, like a kind of uh, electromagnetic grease that keeps things flowing. It's like in the same way that if you have an electric motor, the electricity kind of is like a kind of a fluid grease that keeps the motor spinning, yeah? It's like a it's electricity is very weird substance. I mean even top physicists say they don't quite understand what electricity is. So we're not expected to understand electricity beyond the simple ways in which the Chinese have described it, which is fluid. And that's a good description of the electrical engineer in the background is nodding. <laughs> so that is correct. <laughs> so electricity as fluid is a very valid comparison. Yeah? And in fact, when the ancient Chinese were talking about electricity, and they said that it's, when they talk about qi, and they always brought it back to water and how water moves, yeah, you can do the same thing with electricity. So you can, you can say electricity moves from a high potential difference to low potential difference. So this is like water going down the gradient. Electricity um, flows in a current, just like water, and electricity generates power as it moves, just like water. So... In terms of chi, it's better to think about electricity because also within our body, the chi is moving in these almost invisible channels. Yeah, they, they exist, they're definitely real. I'll show you them later. But the space within these channels is microscopic. It basically practically doesn't exist. And any volume of water within those wouldn't be able to move. But electricity, as we know, doesn't require uh, really any... I mean, how much space does that? One electron, the size of one electron. Yeah, the size of one electron. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that's pretty small. <laughs> one, one to the is it ten to the minus twenty three? Yeah, I can't remember. Something like that. Yeah, I, I was watching something recently. Uh, it's small. It's small. So, so when the electricity, so I'll use those two words kind of interchangeably. It's not ideal, chi and electricity, but just to try and get it into your head. So when the electricity gets stuck, also causes things to get stuck with it. And you can see this with the balloon and the hair. Um, so we've answered the first question, what is chi? It's, it's uh, the organizational force best seen in the embryo. It takes the form of an electrical current that carries information with it and organizes things. Yeah, And that can be seen most clearly in the heart, where it organizes the beating of the heart and then causes um, the blood to move around as a result. And chi stagnation then becomes where that electricity isn't moving, becomes stuck, and as a result would also stick things to it. So the next question. Okay, so the next question is, what is normal liver physiology? So this is where we start to get into the nitty gritty. Can we turn the lights off, actually, of the liver? So, no prizes for guessing what that is there. <coughs> yeah, there are prizes for getting guessing what this is, though. Anyone? Not all of you, some of you may have lost it. 
the, the five Fs is the, uh, the way to remember. Gallbladder, exactly. Yes, this is your gallbladder. The gallbladder is a real organ. It doesn't just exist in kind of airy fairy, Neijing Su Wen terminology. It's real, and not only is it, well, in fact, actually, the gallbladder is the one organ that is way bigger than the Chinese description of it. And there's a reason for that. Well, firstly, it's extraordinary, but secondly, it also moves between all of these levels. It's a very interesting organ, the gallbladder. And the important thing to understand is when you take the physical gallbladder out, it's just one small part of the gallbladder organ. So the gallbladder has very interesting embryology. It grows from your gut into your liver, and then the gallbladder organ is just like a, a fruit hanging down from this tree. And uh, so it stores gall, obviously, and then it tends to get phlegm within it. And as a result, you know, the surgeons go, you don't need that. <laughs> That's generally a surgeon's default position. <laughs> so, um, and they can take it out. So this is your gallbladder. Now, this is keyhole surgery, yeah? Keyhole surgery. Why do surgeons love keyhole surgery so much? Because it's bloodless. It's bloodless and they can move around in this plane and it causes no trauma whatsoever. Once they're into this plane, <coughs> they can... Let me see if I can turn the audio off this. There we are. That one. So once they're into this plane... Ah. Play, where's play? Let's try it. Space, yeah, I tried that in move. Um... Oh, okay. Oh, we'll play it later anyway. So once they're into this plane, which is the peritoneal cavity, anyone heard of peritoneal cavity here? Don't need yeah. Anyone? Yeah. Okay, well, uh, what's a more accurate description of peritoneal cavity? Peritoneal... <laughs> channel. It's a channel. Oh, yes, yes. It's a channel. It's definitely 100% verifiably a channel. A fluid flows in the peritoneal channel. Yeah, It's called a cavity, um, but that's not an accurate description of it. It should be called peritoneal channel. And fluid flows in a circuit, and if that channel gets blocked, which can happen in some cancers, you get ascites, which is a build-up of fluid within this channel. And not only that, but the most common reason for ascites is liver failure. Yeah. Now this is unsurprising because this is the liver channel. Mm. You are you are currently the camera is in the liver channel. Yeah. Mm. So people struggle with this concept sometimes because they're I'm in this room. Yeah. <coughs> so the walls of the room define the room. That the room is the space created by the walls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's fast forward a few. <coughs> So here, here again, here you are in the space, you see. So this is the peritoneal channel. Mm -hmm. Should really call it channel, actually. I mean, if you say it, people will go cavity, but it should really call it a channel. It's definitely a channel. And this is the womb, and this is the fallopian tube, and this is the walls. So, so you, the space is the liver channel. And we'll go into this later. Now, this is really important because the description they give of the liver channel is... It, it flows over the uh, womb, it flows, it flows over the ovaries, it moves. In. Why, why is liver three so important in terms of um, your digestion and abdominal pain? Well, because as I'll explain later, it connects to this entire channel. This channel is huge. This channel goes from here to here and everything in between it practically is floating around in this channel. Yeah, so, so imagine if that's your appendix there. So imagine if you get these things start getting stuck in this channel, yeah? You get terrible pain, it's called adhesions. It's phlegm within the liver channel. Anyway, we'll come back to this, yeah? So we've still got <laughs> liver physiology to deal with first. That's the fun bit. Well, liver physiology isn't, but you try and make it fun. So, um, <laughs> it's more fun than, I learned medical school anyway, definitely more fun. 
Yeah. Uh, Dan Daniel, if you go back one more and then go forward, maybe it'll play the thing again. Oh, that's good thinking. Interestingly, um, I've, I've forgotten your name. Uh, Rob. Rob. Yeah. Rob, yeah. The interesting thing is Rob's dad used to explain uh, Western medicine to Chinese doctors. <laughs> yeah, in, in China. China. Yeah. And now I'm explaining Chinese medicine to <laughs> Western doctors of sort. <laughs> so there's a nice little um, crossover there. Okay, so, yeah, so here, now this is on the loop. So that's gallbladder, it's not the best video, but that's liver there. That's the light. Um, yeah, great. It's difficult to see, but you've got gallbladder, you've got... So the reason I put this video up is to, is to make it really clear that this is a real... We're talking about, when I'm talking about the liver, yeah, you might have noticed my livers aren't capitalised. Mm -hmm. There's no capitalizations in any of my organs. When I talk about an organ, it's the organ, the physical organ. That organ sits within a plane within the body, which is then becomes, well, in this case, the Zhui Yin plane, yeah? Now, if I want to talk about the Zhui Yin plane, which sometimes you kind of need to, then I'll talk about that. But if I'm talking about the liver physical organ, you can talk about the liver organ, yeah? The Zhui Yin plane is bigger than the liver organ. The liver organ is just one part of it. In the same way, for instance, that a tree might be a part of the forest, yeah? But the forest is bigger than a tree. So here we have gallbladder, liver here. Looks like a blood clot, doesn't it? This is one of the ligaments, so that will be a channel. It's a terrible video, sorry about this. And there's the gallbladder. But but the important thing to understand is that when I talk about liver physiology and liver anatomy and all the liver functions, everything, I'm talking about the actual physical liver organ, what is going on in the liver organ. Nothing about, um, you know, it, it's not a capitalised liver, it's not some strange liver that doesn't exist in Western medicine and, and has no parallel. No, this is exactly the same. So, now... The reason why the liver has been capitalised and all the organs has been capitalised is because what the Chinese were describing when they described the body was actually six planes. Yeah? Zhui Yin, so, so when Tai Yang, uh, Xiao Yang, uh, Yang Ming, uh, Tai Yin, uh, yeah, Xiao Yin, Zhui Yin, yeah? That's the order. You've got these six planes, and those six planes um, then create the organs within them. So the organs are condensations of energy within these planes. Now, Western medicine is more than happy to believe in planes within the body in embryology. You've got ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. Yeah, but what happens is that as soon as you, the animals start to get quite complex, then Western medicine just starts kind of zooming in on the detail and it loses the bigger picture. So it, it kind of very rapidly as soon as you get kind of past the jellyfish level of complexity, Western medicine just starts going, oh, that's a liver, that's a heart, instead of looking at their role within the greater structure of the body. But the good news is that the Chinese have always described it as these six planes. So we can just like look at it in terms of these six planes. Now, this massively both simplifies and also makes more sophisticated the model of the body. Massively, it's like it all starts to make much more sense. And from your point of view as acupuncturist, it makes your life a lot easier. For starters, you only have to remember six channels instead of 12. <laughs> Just have to remember that each channel goes into the arm and the leg. Yeah, that's not too tough. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, technically speaking, yeah, this is, this is the liver and this is the portal circulation. What is... Quick... Rick, uh, what does this look like to you, yeah? Portal circulation. If, if you had to... Like a jellyfish. <laughs> jellyfish? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was hoping someone was going to say the, the roots of a tree. Yeah. The roots of a tree. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Roots of a tree. So, again, liver, liver is wood. So, the Chinese knew what they were talking about. So... This, when the body is forming, and this is very difficult to unpick, the embryology of this, but this is all basically part of one layer in the body called the salonic epithelium. 
yeah, which also makes your pericardium, which also makes your coronary arteries, yeah, mm -hmm. and it also makes the key part of the liver, the sinusoidal membrane. So this venous system here is part of the liver. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So so when we talk about so when the Chinese have been saying about liver chi stagnation, yeah, they've also been going, oh, it's a lot broader than the liver, and everyone's gone, what? What are you talking about? Oh, let's just capitalise liver, so that we don't have to explain this any deeper. <laughs> no, I can kind of see why they did it. But we're now saying, look, this is the physical liver. This is created within a plane of the body, and there are only six planes here. Also within this plane is this venous circulation. Yeah, the portal system of the liver, which portal means door. I don't quite know why it's called portal in a way, because basically what, what it actually does, the portal circulation, is it means that the blood goes from the heart um, and then is collected on the venous side and moved through another organ first. So there's actually only two places this occurs. The big one is the liver. And there's also in the brain, there's a tiny little portal circulation. So here we have the liver collecting all this blood from the guts. It all goes to the liver. So if the liver chi gets stagnant, what's going to happen to this blood? This will get stagnant as well. This will start going slowly. And in extremis, this causes, this is what happens in ascites. So when you get liver failure, severe liver failure, this blood backs up terribly, catastrophically in fact. And so you get severe liver chi stagnation, causing blood stagnation, and the blood then backs up so much that you start bleeding out of your mouth and also out of your back passage. So that is severe liver chi stagnation causing severe blood stagnation. So it's all, and you'd also get um, ascites as well with that. So it all, it's all coherent, yeah? It all makes sense. West, East, they're describing the same thing. Makes complete sense. Okay, so it's... <laughs> Any questions so far about... No? Okay. Good. All right. That's great. Um, so we'll come back to this picture later, actually, because it's a... It's an interesting picture. So we're still on liver physiology, yeah? That was, when we start to understand the body as the Chinese described it, we can merge embryology, anatomy, physiology, and they all merge seamlessly into one. Yeah, they're all coherent. In Western medicine, they're all diverse. Yeah, this brings, embryology brings them all together. So this is my drawing of a very simple model of the body, yeah? So basically, what, what I started, to, so with the spark in the machine, I looked at the embryology and said, well, we can, we all come from the embryology. If we understand that, then we can understand how our bodies work. But the problem with the embryology is it's so tiny. Everything interesting occurring is occurring like sub one millimeter in size. Yeah, It's all going crazy when the fetus is, or it's not even, a, is it a zygote or a fetus or whatever, or embryo? So tiny, yeah? And so in order to see what's going on, they have to firstly kill it. Well, that's a problem, isn't it? Because <laughs> you can't see chi moving if something's dead. Um, secondly, they have to fix it. So um, it sounds like something from a mafia uh, novel, but <laughs> fixing it means that basically they, they um, either freeze it or they stain it or something so that it doesn't move. And then they take these pictures of it. And, it, and it's just like kind of blurry, difficult to interpret pictures in two dimensions as well. This is another key thing, actually. Everything's in three dimensions in the real world. So then I thought, okay, well, another way of looking at how we got to where we are is to look at our primitive animal ancestors and see how they function. Yeah, because they're, we're not so different between us and jellyfish. <laughs> <laughs> Like, Jordan Peterson thinks it's lobsters. I say jellyfish. Yes. <laughs> so, a jellyfish has an inside, outside, and a middle. Yeah, very simply. And the interesting thing is, the inside and the outside of a jellyfish are exactly the same kind of cells as our inside and outside. So they are even called endoderm and ectoderm. Yeah? And then what happens is, as the jellyfish effectively gets bigger, more complex, is that a heart is created within this animal to start pumping fluid around. 
Now, why does it create a heart? Well, the basic problem, so this is the gut, and this is obviously a, a model of a, a more complex animal. The basic problem is that this nutrition in the gut, yeah, in a jellyfish is limited as to how far it can diffuse, yeah? So the, if the cells here are too far away from the gut, they will not receive enough nutrition and they will die. So the jellyfish is kind of limited in how big and complex it can become. So then flatworms emerge. Now flatworms have a very primitive heart that pump fluid around. It's not a closed circulatory system. So in other words, your lymphatic fluid and your, uh, the fluid within your heart mix. It's called an open circulatory system. It enabled the animal to get bigger and flatworms, you know, so flatworms are literally just worms that are flat, <laughs> um, developed. But still, animals wanted to get bigger and bigger, and so they wanted higher pressures. That was the key thing, yeah? The key thing to remember about the heart is pressure. And so the animal developed a heart. The heart pumped blood in a closed circulatory system. It picks up nutrition from the gut and then circulates it back. And in that way, and if you had it fully, it would also be going out here as well, the heart. So in that way, it can supply all of the animal because with a closed circulatory system, and by that I just mean arteries, it can create high pressures and it, so you can grow bigger. Now, the heart is a very delicate organ on a physical as well as a spiritual ground. And so this... This stuff that it picked up from the gut, it was picking up everything. It, you know, the, the blood was picking up bacteria and all kinds of toxins. So what it did is it sends it through the liver here to clean it, yeah, before sending it back. So these cells here are the liver cells, derived from something called the salomic epithelium. Yeah, don't worry about the word. It's basically your body cavity. Your body cavity, do you remember I showed you the picture before? Mm -hmm. The peritoneal channel, mm -hmm. see even I call it a cavity, <laughs> it's a channel. <laughs> the peritoneal channel, it, the cells that make the liver are derived from that channel. They grow inwards and then form the liver and it, it all gets very complex. But in our six layer model of the body, it's the same, yeah? The liver and this channel are the same, very important. So the blood picks up nutrition from the gut, tie in, sends it out through the liver where it's cleaned and back again to be circulated around the body. But in the liver, it, the key thing the liver does, and this is incredible because this was like missed at a systemic level for hundreds of years in Western medicine. The key thing the liver does is separate blood from lymph. So it takes the blood and it literally pushes it through a colander like spaghetti. Like it, it, I mean, the colander is a, uh, a, a cylinder, mm -hmm. and it's, so it's spraying out on all sides, but the, the lymph is being sprayed out from, oh, let me show you the picture. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, this picture, I, I don't know, some people see all kinds of things in this picture. I, <laughs> I, I don't understand it. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what, if you ever want to understand something, then try drawing it. By drawing it, because this picture <laughs> took me three days to draw, yeah? And I was even sober, some of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, it stopped, which is annoying, because it should be on. Anyway, so, this is a liver sinusoid. Now, the reason it's drawn one, two, three, four, five, six, <coughs> is because uh, the liver is understood to be arranged in these hexagrams. Yeah, and so I thought I'd draw in six. But basically, the functional unit is the sinusoid, which is this. The red part here represents the little bit of arterial blood that comes into the liver. Yeah, so the liver also receives blood from the general circulation, from the directly from the heart as well as the portal system. The portal system being in the gut. Now, this might seem at this point like, what is he going on about it? This is 
totally, totally clarifies in your head what is going on. Once you understand this, totally clarifies and simplifies what you are doing with the liver. Yeah, massively, massively. It it's all becomes really simple. Um, but at the moment, it's all a bit new, so it might be challenging. So the arterial blood comes in. This is the blood from the portal system coming in here, yeah? And what is going on here is three things. So does anyone, if you've read Wang Ju Yi's book, yeah, Applied Channel Therapy, Chinese medicine, he talks about the liver dredges, drains, and regulates. Yeah, now this, um, when I read this, I was like, oh, wow, you know, that's perfect, because that is a perfect description of what the liver is actually doing. So let's get a scale, firstly. This is a red cell, which is about five micrometers in diameter, yeah? So what's that? Five one thousandth of a millimeter. And these sinusoids are about the same. They're about six micrometers. So the red cells are squeezed down here, yeah? In fact, I think I've got this animation slightly wrong because I've got a feeling that when they actually go down, I hate PowerPoint passion. <laughs> Why isn't this playing? Uh, right, okay. So we'll have a break and I'll fix it in a bit. Um, so when I think when these red cells get squeezed down here, squeezed, I think is the word, I think they are actually like get bottled up and have to be pushed through by the pressure. Yeah, because in fact, actually, the diameter of the sinusoids, these, this, so this is like a specialized capillary, is actually the same or even slightly smaller than the red cells. So they get pushed through, yeah? Now, it's like pushing through something through a... Um, a sausage maker or something like that, but you've got here, you've got tiny little holes in the capillary. Very unusual for a capillary to have this. These are called fenestra, which are Latin for window. Okay, so these are tiny fenestra. Now, these fenestra are something like um, they're, they're nanometer in size, yeah, they are unbelievably tiny. Unbelievably tiny, so tiny that I struggle to even illustrate them. Um, and, and the incredible thing about these fenestra now, thanks to electron microscopes, is we know that they're all surrounded <coughs> by a tiny little muscle. Tiny little muscle. Tiny muscle. What, and what happens to muscles when you zap them with a bit of electricity? They contract. They contract. They contract. Exactly. So these fenestra are able to contract and close off and control how much fluid leaves the portal system and goes into this space here, which is called the space of Disse, after a German embryologist, I believe he was. And this space here is where the magic starts to happen. Okay, so we'll have a... <laughs> Any questions? And then we'll have a 10 minute break and then we'll, we'll carry on. Yes, yeah, sorry, I've got one question. Yeah. Are you saying the pressure drives it? Is that the pressure created from the heart? Because you've got some Good blood question. coming directly in from the heart, but yeah. where's the pressure coming in from the, or from the veins to the gut and all of that? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you, I'm not going to let you steal my thunder. So. <laughs> 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 um, uh, tai, tai Chong. Tai Chong means great pulse, and, and, it's, and it's a very interesting, very interesting name for a point, um, because every other point with Chong in it is either on a pulse or is pericardium or heart. And then, well, there's one more, Guan Chong, which is on triple burner, but basically every other, every other point with Chong within it is basically, you can relate to the pulse in some way, apart from Tai Chong. And so what that is, we'll, I'll come to. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. This is probably so basic in comparison, but when you think of the liver storing, the, yeah. Word, yeah. the word storage yeah. is sedentary. 
you think of like stories like Lena Lada, or yeah. that, and there's nothing sedentary about the sport. Oh, no, 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 not at all. Like, no, this, this live is dynamic, yeah. <laughs> this is like, a, I mean, I drew it like this. I mean, it's very interesting that the things that people, the, the, the what people see there, <laughs> because of what the liver does do. You know, the liver is absolutely critical in, in this function, <laughs> but also um, it's regimented as well, do you see? And, and, and I think the liver actually is, you know, the liver's the general, and I think its structure is very regimented. Um, and it's very efficient, it's like Teutonic German, and it's kind of like the way it just, it's just a machine, it's an absolute machine. Um, and, but the storage of blood is, is important, and that is basically about, um, that, that's because the liver's the whole layer as well. So the, when we say liver, well, really it's the Jouet Yin sort of stored blood. And we'll, we'll come to that. So already, right, if we look at storage of blood, we've got, so that is a pretty big vein. Yeah, I mean, that's enormous. That. The liver physically stores about 500 mils of blood, which can be released. But not only that, but it's dominating this entire venous system here. And when we look at the, when we look at the uh, actual um, liver channel, we'll see that also is on a vein as well, where it's a famous vein. So it's like, uh, the liver definitely stores blood, but also the channel, the Jouet Yin channel, also stores a lot of blood as well. Mm. But yeah, it's really dynamic. The liver's, I mean, you'd expect it to be, isn't it? It's the general, it's, it's very dynamic, it's doing a very important job. And, um, and yeah, what we'll talk about next is, is how, to, how to understand the chi in this, because at the moment we're just looking at physical liver. And, and what's the difference between life and death? Chi. Yeah, energy, yeah. So, so I mean, the physical liver is like kind of, you know, I, I said, I gave a talk to a bunch of physiotherapists and I started the talk off um, PowerPoint was malfunctioning, so I, I just <laughs> had to go on a different tangent. And I said, um, I said to them, you know, a crowd of 100 people, I said, how do you know your patient's alive? And everyone, like, nervously laughed. And I was like, no, I'm serious. How do you know your patient's alive? And eventually, we agreed that it was because the patient was animated, was moving in some way. It was energy that defined the fact that they were alive. And it's energy tests that we use to define somebody being alive. So if somebody comes into the A&E department dead, where they're not dead until they've had an ECG that says they're dead, yeah. then they're dead. <laughs> but <laughs> if that ECG shows anything, any flicker of life, then it will be like, Ah! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're still alive. <laughs> Just. <laughs> so, so, the key thing, we'll, we'll have a break and then I'll talk about this. This is, this is where this comes in, basically. So this, this is, we, we've got to start seeing the liver in terms of the, the energy that's flowing through it. Yeah? Last question. When you're saying fluids are leaving your finestra, is that Lymphatic fluid, you're saying it separates blood from lymphatic? Yes. Okay, just yes. wondering what's leaving. Exactly. Okay. And what, what's the Jouet channel paired with? What's the liver paired with? Pericardium. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. And also, uh, oh, so what's Jouet Yin paired with? Pericardium. Shaoyang. Oh, Shaoyang, which is gold bladder. Is lymph and, yeah. and fascia. <laughs> yeah, that's simple. Shaoyang is just lymph and fascia. Yeah, lymph flows and fascia. The gall, the gallbladders. That's a lecture for another day. But the, the gallbladder, the gallbladder's role within Shao Yang is very interesting. But it basically functions as this motor that drives, like, the lymph through the liver and cleans it in the process. So it's like this motor just driving it through. Yeah, like a. Aldi car engine or something, <laughs> <laughs> and it's working well. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, I, I could just very, very quickly just go through this again, actually, just, just because this is quite critical, so we'll talk about it afterwards. So this is your sinusoidal membrane, this is your arterial blood, portal blood, liver cells, yeah, gall with bile ducts, yeah, and this is the blood that turns to the heart. Yeah. 